Emily, um, we'll go back to the original plan and I'm going to introduce Dean who is now online. Hi Dean. Good morning. <laughs> Yay. All right Dean, um, I'm going to introduce you to the room and then I'm going to get you to get started. So Dean is the CEO of Collect Carbon, an innovative carbon development business working with landholders to combine production with carbon farming. Collect Carbon has specialised in carbon projects with its parcelists. Uh, so based on an understanding of the carbon sector and sheep and cattle production in the rangeland, introduced here today in court drive. Dean will discuss the types of landscape and vegetation needed to produce carbon. He will uh, tell us what you have to do to start the process and where to get help and what it could be worth to your business. So something I'm sure we all actually want to know more about. So Dean, look at that, way ahead of me. Thanks Dean, I'll kick off to you. all walk out and I wouldn't know um, but hopefully Louise will jump in and tell me to stop if that's the case. Um, I really didn't intend to be there yesterday and that's been explained. I apologise that I'm not. Um, Travel in and out of WA is not a good area to know but still so unfortunately that wasn't possible but I hope we can still have a decent conversation this way um, and I'm sure if there is any interest there will be plenty of opportunity for follow-up one way or another. Um, so certainly from this presentation from me, I'm going to try and cover everything that we've just outlined already there, but I do need to let you know it's not everything covered. All the details around what's involved in a carbon project and a property that you might manage or own is not captured in this next 30 minutes. Um, it takes more than that. If anyone fully grasped it from my presentation, you'd be the first person on the panel to do so. So if this leaves you with some questions, Phil, that's entirely normal and good, and I hope we can answer as many of them as we can today. That's no doubt why you're here. But if it still takes you some time and you go away and think about it and have some other questions, by all means, then we'll find a way to get those answers to you. So I'll just keep ploughing on here unless someone at your end jumps in. Um, I'm happy to take questions as we go. I'm suspecting that it might be easier if I just keep going and, and we have questions at the end, given the, the awkwardness of doing it remotely. But um, Louise or anyone else there, just jump in and uh, butt in and I can pull up if that's needed. So just quickly, a little bit of brief, brief background about uh, Select Carbon. So Select Carbon operating since 2010 and why I put that date up is that it's, it's kind of weird because in, in a way it's the start of the carbon industry in Australia. So we've been there through various ups and downs over the last decade um, and we're still there and we've seen a lot to change. You know, the, the, the sector and the opportunities for people like you have gone from a possibility uh, a lot of uncertainty around, you know, who, what, what did it all mean on both sides of the ledger, production and supply, what was the point of it all, how did it work, through to something that's actually quite well developed. It's a highly regulated industry now, contrary to what perhaps a lot of people think. There is a lot of regulation, but that's what our business does, is to, to help you through that. Um, also, um, for... Total awareness where Select Carbon is a wholly owned subsidiary of Shell, uh, Shell Australia now. Uh, I say that just so you know, but also it indicates the maturity in the sector that entities such as Shell are uh, active players and see the long term role for this sector. So we operate and with landholders 70 projects or thereabouts um, in the, across Australia. Unfortunately, none in South Australia at present. A lot of our projects are in WA, but we started in New South Wales and Queensland. And I'm talking to you from Perth in WA. Projects uh, span 10 million hectares. So we're used to scale. Our projects range in size from properties that are 
uh, you know, a few ten, you know, tens, tens of thousands of hectares to our largest project being over a million hectares. Um, the fourth point there I wanted to draw your attention to is not as a sales pitch here, but in Select Carbon and, and in this sector, it's not just pointy headed people who, are, who love carbon. Maybe we're that too, but in our business, we have people with agricultural background, agricultural science, practical farm management experience, livestock production, environmental science, the carbon accounting itself, of course, a very strong team in remote sensing and analysis of remote sensing data. We have a field crew, we have legal, and we can trade the carbon credits. So it's a, a sector that brings in lots of people and lots of expertise, and it's needed. Uh, all of those elements are needed. My background is in ag science and livestock production. That's what got me into the carbon game, if I can call it that. I'm interested in productive and sustainable landscapes where people can make a living. And um, animal nutrition is what I spent most of my career on, and including seven years at Roseworthy. So I've got, um, I can't be with you today, but I do know South Australia and spent time there and, and understand um, the region that, that you're in and the, and the, the opportunities um, and constraints that you might be facing. So I think that's important just to understand that for something that might appear very new, there's a whole bunch of us in, in this business that come from a, a, an agricultural and a livestock background. And we very much, and it's my you know really strong passion in this, is that the livestock business that you're managing has to become better with the carbon project and not compromised. They have to be, at best, align uh, with each other. And what we really strive for is that both of them enhance each other. And that's possible. So, enough of that. Um, if I uh, I'll launch into trying to understand, help help you understand. I'm not sure where where obviously you're all at with your knowledge around the carbon sector and the opportunities. So, apology apologise if it's too simple for some and too much for others. But I want to start by pointing out some characteristics of carbon farming that really put it quite different than any other commodity. It, it actually is a commodity. It's something that you potentially can produce on your property. So therefore it's a commodity and people want it. But it also has some quite distinct differences that can do your head in when you first try and understand carbon farming. What's the same about any other commodity is that it, well, it's real. So if, if someone was selling gold uh, or copper from nearby mine, um, you know, it's a real thing. Someone someone wants copper or they, they, they buy the ore and they extract the copper or they buy the copper directly. It's a real thing. Um, it's measurable and verifiable. Someone doesn't sell a truckload of dirt and say, well, there's copper in there and hope for the best. It, it's weighed, it's verified, it's measured and it's tradable. There is a marketplace for that to be, for that commodity be, to be traded. Same with your cattle. You sell a truckload of cattle, it, there's a, a number, there's a weight, you know what it is, the RFID, RFID tags in, it's verifiable and, and you can sell them, you can trade them. What's different, and this for many people who sort of sit on the outside of the sector kind of go, oh wow, that's, I don't see how this can work, but it, it can and it does. The commodity in this case stays where it's produced. Um, so, put it another way, the producer of the commodity gets to keep it. So, someone buys the carbon that's produced and there's carbon in those trees in that photograph and as the trees grew, there's an increase in the carbon that's being stored, mostly in the woody biomass, but in the leaves and in the roots included. Someone wants those, that carbon that's stored in a tree because it can help offset unavoidable emissions that might be associated with their business or their enterprise. But where that carbon stored is likely to be in a different location when where, than where the emissions are occurring. So the carbon has to stay where it is because it's part of a living biological system. We don't cut the trees down and put it in a truck and sell it to someone. The carbon has to be stored in living material. Um, 
So, so that presents an interesting concept that you get paid for something, but it remains under your management. And on the downside, you think, well, hang on, so I've got to keep it there. It's still my obligation, yet I've already sold it. How does that work? A really key concept that flows from this is that in carbon farming, you're producing both a financial asset and a natural asset. So there's quite a few words in, on this slide and I'll just walk you through them. So on the left hand side is the financial asset that you're producing. And these are the things I've really already mentioned. It's a tradable asset, an Australian carbon credit unit or an ACU, as is often referred to, is a financial unit. By law, it's treated as a property right in the sense that whoever uh, buys it owns it and that person can sell it to someone else. Who does buy it? Uh, in 2010 to 2015 and probably even pretty much up to 2017, really the only game in town to speak of was the Australian government as a buyer of carbon credits that you might produce. That's changed rapidly and significantly in the last couple of years and, and will change for the better um, even more in the years ahead. I have state governments there in brackets. Uh, they're showing more and more interest in participating in the carbon market in one shape or form. Different state governments are at different levels um, and different, and they're playing as a, as a participant in the market in different ways. And we can talk about that later if, if you wish. But the really big change is that there's now a lot of business entities that are purchasing carbon credits for one of two reasons. Some have a legal obligation for offsetting their emissions. Um, but more and more are voluntarily purchasing carbon credits to offset emissions to meet their decarbonisation strategies, their sustainability strategies, their sh shareholder interests, um, leadership from the board, all those things, you're hearing it in the news, more and more companies are, are pledging for their operations to head towards carbon neutrality. How do you reach carbon neutrality? You reduce emissions that you can reduce, but those that are hard to reduce, you have to offset. You have to actively store more carbon in the landscape than, uh, than you're emitting, or at least equal to be, to be net zero. And this is the opportunity you've got for us to explore today, is um, can you be a producer of the carbon credits that other people want? You can use them yourself, of course, so well, I don't have a dot point there, but who, someone who produces a carbon credit can use that themselves and make a claim towards carbon neutrality. So you might, a producer uh, might direct market their, their meat, and if, if there was the purchaser of the meat and you saw a marketing advantage to say this, this beef is carbon neutral, some of those carbon credits, or indeed all of them, or a portion of them may have come from your property. Uh, when you make a claim, you can't also sell the carbon credit. The carbon credit's effectively retired because you've used that carbon to make a legitimate claim. You can't then sell it because that person who buys it may also make the claim, and then there'd be double counting, which is uh, contrary to the, the verification and the legitimacy of this, of this sector. Importantly, most of the carbon projects relevant to you, and I'm focusing on one today, are 25 year long ventures, but you can earn carbon credits in each of those years. So although you have to keep the carbon in your landscape, it's not like you get paid once and then have an encumbrance of keeping these trees on your property forever or for 25 years without it linking to an income. You can earn an income in each of the 25 years of a 25-year of a project. And projects of this type have, have to be 25 or 100 years in duration, and that, that's written into legislation. And that's because the carbon that's stored needs to be there for a, a long period of time. Um, it used to be 100 years only, but 25-year uh, projects were brought in within the last decade, and it's a good thing because it brings it into the remit of you know, a generation and a current management plan. Now on the right hand side, um, uh, the natural assets, I'm just looking at my watch here and cautious of, I do tend to delve deeper than I intended because I want, I want you to know as much as, as I can get across, but 
uh, give me some warning perhaps at that end if um, as we're getting close. But the natural asset's really important. Um, it stays on your property. The trees that are growing, that have carbon in them, that are earning you carbon credits, you have to keep those trees for the duration of the project. Um, but that's a good thing. So really, I'm, I'm talking about it as a natural asset, not as an encumbrance. Not only can you keep them, you have to keep them. Uh, so you can't grow a tree, get a carbon credit, and then knock it over willfully. Um, but in the rangeland setting, that's not really an option anyway. I mean, you, you can clear to put in tracks and fences and fire breaks. It's not that you can't do normal practices. That's taken into account in the way we run a project. Uh, but the natural asset is there for the duration. And so it's really important then that you find a way, and this is what we do, and this is why I get up each morning to work on this, is that we find ways for it to add value to your enterprise. And I've said it a number of times, and I'm labour it again, it should be seen as an asset to your enterprise, not an encumbrance, because there are lots of ways that a well-managed carbon project builds your livestock, set your livestock business, can make it more profitable, easier or less risky or, or combinations of those things. Underpinning a carbon project that we'll talk about next is grazing management. And why is that a good thing? And so why when I say you've got this natural asset, it's an asset, uh, it's good for your business. It's good in many different ways and, and which one's most important to you depends on your circumstance, where you are, what you're trying to do with your business, but includes things like building the feed on offer, managing the grazing, resting country, well-timed grazing to stimulate new plant growth is all important for a carbon project and it's all important for managing your feed on offer and having a line of sight for how much feed you've got ahead of you. Good grazing diversifies the diet and if I don't dribble on too much here, I really want to give you some examples at the end about this. It's not directly related to carbon, but I can't help myself. So if any of you walk away from here and think carbon's not for me, I'd hope there's still something in this presentation. You go, oh, okay, maybe that was. And it's really, really an opportunity that's too good to miss for us to understand. I think it's a forgotten management tool about managing animals so they learn to diversify their diet. Well-managed vegetation improves water infiltration, holds it in the land, where it falls is where it's used rather than surface water flows being higher than water infiltration rates. So many of our landscapes, we export water and topsoil now. Um, we desperately want rain, of course, and when it comes in heavy falls, we, it can be damaging. So we want to build systems that are, are better suited to what's quite likely is, is drying and when it does rain, um, having you know really significant events. And we want to be able to capture that water and put it to productive use. Shade and shelter, I put at the end, it, it, it seems like an afterthought to put it there, but I'm finding it's been a, it's another little soapbox of mine, which I won't step on today, but providing the right micro environment for animals, even in your massive landscapes, the temperature at which those animals are making their living is a really critical driver to productivity. And in an in a environment that is heating up, the provision of shade in appropriate locations that are used uh, is actually really important. And I'm talking and hearing more and more from producers who are seeing this as a production limitation to them in quite a range of different environments in Australia of building into their farm plan the provision of shade uh, for not only animal wel welfare, but animal productivity as well. But the trees that are growing new carbon is creating a habitat as well um, and can grow a good feed base underneath it and provide shade and shelter amongst it. So another slide with dot points and then we get to a few pictures to break it up a bit. But um, the key part of the most likely carbon project suitable to you is one that's called human induced regeneration. It's a bit of a clunky and horrible name, but that's what it's called. Um, there, are, there are other carbon methodologies, as it's called. I'll list them at the end. This is the one that's most suited to pastoral um, systems and the rangelands and grazing systems in the pastoral areas. It's underpinned by the simple statement up the top that it's through your grazing management that you're allowing 
the regeneration of native trees on your place to, to go from a juvenile young sapling through to reaching what's referred to as forest cover, which I'll, I'll explain shortly. The underlying is, uh, premise, I guess, behind it is that these small plants that are already naturally have, have germinated and, and are growing now, uh, and if there are none, then, then the projects can't be started. Um, but where there are juvenile saplings, young, young plants on your property, in the past, the grazing management might have stopped those from ever getting to reach maturity, if you like, reaching um, forest cover by, the, by that definition, which I'll come to in a minute, um, or unmanaged feral animals or other grazing pressures was, in, was imposing a limitation on that regrowth. So it's through grazing management that the regrowth and the regeneration can be allowed to continue. That, that's an underlying concept in this methodology. And so in the second dot point, we're looking for vegetation that might be termed sparse woody. So there's some woody trees in the vegetation, they're, sp they're spread apart and there's juvenile plants coming up in between it. Um, it's very hard to explain in words, very, very easy to see if we were walking around on a, on a paddock with you, which would be a lot more, a lot more fun and a lot more pr productive for, for this conversation. But if you can imagine when you go home and you, and you are driving around and you're on your water run or mill run is, you know, have a look at what is coming up. And I, I've had many pastoralists say over the years that, you know, I start seeing this stuff now because I'm looking for it. Previously, little acacias that were coming up or, uh, you know, mulgars, uh, it doesn't matter what the species are. You might not really have had an eye on it as being that important because it's not the quality feed. But once you see that there is another value in these plants, then you can start to see it. So you might think, well, I don't know, I've got too much of that, but I'd encourage you to, you know, to have a look with, perhaps with new eyes up, um, after this conversation. But what we're looking for is areas of the landscape where, where there's some woody vegetation, juvenile plants, doesn't have to be covering every square centimetre of the place, but when they grow up over the next 25 years, they reach, they have potential to reach forest cover. And forest cover in these sorts of landscapes that you're in and we work in is when the plants reach 20% canopy cover at a height of at least two metres. It's, it's a technical definition. It's made up by a person and is arbitrary, but that's the rules. Um, in a semi-arid landscape, that's the accepted definition of forest. So obviously quite different from the Amazon, but it's, it's, it's what we use for the definition of forest in this method. So what is 20% canopy cover? It's really important for you running a livestock business. We're not talking about wall-to-wall -wall thickets of, of encroachment or woody weeds. The, the visualisation of it is more of an open woodland and diversity, and that's really important to maintain your productivity, as I mentioned, and, and as I'll say shortly. So to help visualise it remotely, um, I hope there's not too much of a lag for these slides to be coming through, but this is an aerial photograph uh, from a drone above a monitoring site uh, of a project in Western Australia. But you can imagine if of those larger trees, the circumference of that is the canopy area, and you look at it on a unit. Um, we we have to assess it on a 0 0.2 hectare scale, but if you you imagine you pace out, you know, 40 metres by 40 metres, and then you you know that's a pixel if you like. That's a, that's a unit. Is that area covered? 20% or more of that area covered by canopy? And in in this image, uh, I would say it is. Uh, we're only counting the, the two metres or above trees, not, not the smaller shrubs or the grasses. Uh, it might help to visualise it down at ground level. So this is Clint, uh, my colleague, is the model. So in the background is the existing forest. So, you know, I, I reiterate there, when we talk about forest and you think, well, I don't have any forest, you know, you will have. There will be patches where there where there are two metres and 
you know, just above the average human height um, with enough density to, to cover 20% of, of a little patch that, that, that they're in. What you want to be looking for is the regenerating vegetation that hasn't reached two metres. That stick that Clint is holding is two metres tall. Um, we do the assessment by remote analysis, remote data from satellites, but we do on ground as well. We have to and we'd want to. Nothing beats getting out there on the ground. So, so you've seen a drone image. This is a ground image. What we ultimately produce from satellites, drones and field measurements are a series of maps for the landscape. Um, and here are two. These are real ones um, and I pulled them out to show you how different it can be uh, and what following conversations with you and any work that we, we do if you're interested. Uh, this, this is a very big step of the process. It's what we've got 10 people uh, in an office who we occasionally let out uh, who do this work, who sit um, with a whole pile of remote sensing data. It's not all visual data. It's not like a, a Google Earth image where they use that too, but there's a whole heap of different spectral bands that come from satellites and they analyse it, train the computer to understand what it is through, you know, a pretty sophisticated process that takes, um, you know, a team of experts. And I don't mean to sound, um, you know, bit weird there saying it that way, but it's a big step, <coughs> excuse me, and it's a really important part to get right. So the image on the left, the three colours that we've classified the landscape into three categories. Green is what's already forest by that definition I just gave you. So forest, you think open woodland really, but where the canopy is 20% already at the start of the project. So at any point in the last 10 years before a project starts, if it was forest cover by that definition, it's classified as that and is not eligible to earn carbon credits. So existing trees that have reached forest cover do not earn you carbon credits. And that, that's one concept that many people assume, it's the big trees that earn you carbon credits. On the contrary, it's the little trees that are growing to become big trees that earn you carbon credits. And in the, in the map there, that's the orange areas that we've identified through the remote sensing and then we'll verify with, with uh, field data from plots is that it's got the right vegetation type in, of species and state of growth, that it has potential to reach forest cover. The blue areas are areas that are deemed, at least at this point in time, to have no potential to reach forest cover. Uh, why would they have no potential to reach forest cover? Could be anything from you know, it's a gibber plain, it's a rocky ridge, it's a salt lake, it's open spinifex country, it's grasslands. Uh, and some of that country is your most productive for grazing. Um, and that's good. Uh, the pattern, so the orange is what we want for carbon, is the areas where it's not yet forest cover but has potential. And if we were able to zoom in on this, you would see that well, those orange blobs are actually made up of pixels that represent 0 0.2 hectares. Sometimes they're all that those, those little pixels are clumped together and you see a big large blob. Other times they're relatively scattered. The property on the right is in a different landscape. They're both in WA, but the ve vegetation, the soil and the landscape is quite different. And so the distribution and the density of the eligible areas the orange areas, so that's a term that we use, carbon eligible areas or carbon estimation areas, is quite different. Um, you might be able to see on the image on the right, if, if it's coming through okay for you, the kind of green lines on the left hand side uh, of the property. Um, uh, it's sand dunes is, is, is what that's reflecting, so there's vegetation um, associated with it, those sand dunes that are already reach, have, have already attained forest cover, but there's a whole lot of pockets around it that aren't yet, but could become so. And that's why there's that distinct pattern. Um, when we produce these maps and have them on a, a smartphone or a tablet and you drive around, you should be
be able to see as you move through these, yeah, okay, that's what that is. And it's really important that we do that with you so that you kind of understand the sort of landscapes that are most relevant. But it will be very different from one person to the next in terms of the species that are contributing to those orange areas, the parts of the landscape, are they in the creek lines, are they in the floodplains, are they adjacent to sand dunes? It will depend on your situation. Um, right, so just jumping back a little bit out of order, but um, kind of love this photo. This one's from New South Wales, but Dean, we talk about wood. Dean, can you hear yep. me? Yeah, I just wanted to give you a 15 minute heads up. <laughs> so um, just to Great. let you know, right? And it's going good. There's no lag. Oh, good. Good. I'll be down in 15 minutes. So thank, but thanks for that. Um, and I hope no one's walked out. So th this um, photograph here is it just it just you know visually brings forward the the other advantages of woody vegetation because I can imagine and you quite rightly be thinking well you're sort of encouraging the vegetation that I might not really be wanting as a pastoralist for my for feed but I see it in a way that we've got to be encouraging the growth of plants that are able to survive in the landscape and if the woody vegetation in some of the more open country is what's got capacity the mulga, some of the acacia species, those those hardy plants, they're the ones that will be able to crack through the hard pan if that's what you've got. And it, that is what we've got on a lot of the properties that we work with. But what comes along for the ride is the understory, the shrubs that are edible, the grasses, you know, and clearly here water infiltration and soil condition, even under a recently dead tree, is so much better. And it's because of the organic matter that's beneath it, that's because of the seed bank that's beneath it, it's because of insect activity. What's the, one of the major drivers for water infiltration in many of these landscapes? It's ant, um, ant activity and little little gaps that are created in the, in the profile for water to infiltrate. Um, I had a, a long drive with an entomologist, you know, an insect specialist, um, three hours in a car journey and I and I'm sitting in the back seat with an insect specialist I thought well buckle in this is going to be a long trip but it was fascinating to learn how important these little creatures in the soil are for water infiltration much more than I'd ever appreciated and where are they they tend to be near these um, near the vegetated areas I slightly digress um, the key question you're asking um, and I'll leave myself five minutes at the end to race through some, some grazing management. And you don't know how hard it is for me to do that because that's what I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, look, a really unhelpful answer is it depends, you know, and that's what scientists say, isn't it? And, and what people, when you say, look, what well, what's it mean to me? Show me the money. So, well, it depends, but there's truth in that, but, but I will give you some numbers. Um, it depends on these four things. The one in black are largely out of your control. So the number of hectares of those orange areas, if you can imagine that map I just showed you, they, we call them carbon estimation areas. Um, how many hectares of that have you got? It's a function of previous land use, historical land use, your soil type, your land systems of vegetation. Um, but remember, you're looking for those areas at pretty fine scale. So you don't need your whole northern half of your property to fall into that category. You can be little patches here and there. The carbon yield that comes from the growth of those small trees as they, as they grow up depends on the productivity of your location. And, and the carbon content in that vegetation is estimated through a computer simulation model. It's called FullCam. It's written into the methodology. It's, it's, it's what we must use. It's not a select carbon thing. It's, a, it's what this methodology requires uh, everyone to use. And so the growth of vegetation in a more arid, tougher environment is slower than in one that has a higher rainfall and better soil type. And the model knows that because it's, it's place-based. So that there's geo GPS locations that are, are put as inputs into the model. It knows where it is. It knows the soil types. It knows the previous 100 years of rainfall data for that location, the nearest nearest source of data available for rainfall, and it models, it, it simulates the growth of the vegetation and expresses that in carbon. 
The price of the carbon credit is something out of your control too. That's obviously a big factor like any commodity, uh, just as it is with your cattle, you know that well. What is, is, what is in your control is your management and the management allows the carbon stocks, the, the stock of carbon in your landscape to increase. Um, although a computer simulation model expresses the carbon that's being accumulated in the vegetation, this is not a computer game. We do have to verify it and show it's real. And if the model said it was growing, but but you had were smashing it with un, you know feral animals coming in from the the northeast and everything was looking poor, then you would not have a viable project. I'm, I'm being I'm exaggerating things there, but your management is a is a key part of a carbon project. Um, so. I'm going to put some numbers here. I do it quite nervously because every time we put a number up, it, it does naturally give an expectation, a high one or a low one. And I really do want to, to emphasise that these numbers may be well under, about right or well over for you because I just don't know, you know, where your place is and what you've got there. But hopefully there's enough here for you to go away and maybe tweak it from your from your own perspective and then a lot more follow-up, um, you know, to really become more confident in the numbers for you. But I've worked on a thousand hectares and I've very deliberately been conservative here in the estimates. So, you know, the last thing I want to do is talk to people about this. It's a great opportunity to become a millionaire overnight and, you know, and you find out it's not true. So I think there's potential upside to this, but without knowing your situation, I've deliberately gone cautious and conservative. But if those orange areas on the maps we were looking at a few slides ago was only 10% your property area, and I'm just using nice round numbers here and you had 100,000 hectares, you would have 10,000 hectares of carbon estimation areas. That's the CEA there. And for reference, most places in what we call the southern rangelands in Western Australia, which would have similarity to some of your country, uh, would be around 15 to 20 percent of their property are orange on that map, the carbon estimation areas. So I've gone on the low side here just to be cautious. What's the productivity of the carbon that's growing in those orange pixels? I've gone conservative to say half a, a carbon credit, that's an ACU, an Australian carbon credit unit, in each hectare of those orange pixels. Uh, and for reference, again, across all of our projects, that ranges from about 0.5 up to 2 per hectare, depending on where you are in the country. So again, I've gone low end, just to be cautious. If you do those sums, that works out to be 5,000 ACUs per year. Uh, it's not the same every year because the trees don't grow in a linear fashion every year. So bear that in mind. This is, an, this is to give you a feel. It'll start off less and it will increase over time as, you know, in a curve. If you were to plot it out, it would be in a curve that starts slow, speeds up and then flattens out over 25 years. At a carbon price of $17, which is about where it's at now, that example is worth $85,000 um, in, in monetary terms. So there's lot, lots of if, buts and maybes there to relate it to you, but it gives you some feel. And around carbon price, the graph that's showing there is uh, the spot trade. You can you can look at this yourself on the, the website there, accuse.com.au. It's from OMF. It's a carbon trader. Um, it's their data um, in the Coal Bank, I think. And it shows the last year. And there's been a spike in the recent month, and the price is hitting nearly $18, which is a um, which is a high in the last 12 months. So there was a flat line during COVID as a lot of the buyers of carbon credits were buckling down and trying to survive and the demand flatlined. It didn't go away, um, but it is picking up again. So I'm going to probably in, I'm going to speed up what I say now. I'm very, very happy to talk more about this if, if time permits and question time. 
But I really want to just also leave you with the idea, we're talking about management, it's absolutely critical in a carbon project that we can show the person who's running the project is doing something that they weren't doing before. It's called additionality in carbon. You have to say that the carbon that's growing in the vegetation is over and above what would have happened anyway. If the tree was there, you did nothing different and it grew, you're actually not eligible to earn a carbon credit. You're eligible to earn a carbon credit because your management has made it possible for that carbon to be in, in the vegetation. And under this methodology, it, the, the management practice, the overarching sentence is managing the timing and extent of grazing. And the good news for you is that's what pastoral production and livestock is as well, managing the timing and extent of grazing. But we want to be able to show that you're taking on new practice. It doesn't, new practices. It doesn't need to be new to mankind, new to science, but it's it's you implementing it in a new way in your business. And the next two slides, this one and one after, are, are real examples of people we're working with because the activities are, are varied. Um, some are using infrastructure, so some are, um, putting in new fences to allow to create paddocks. A lot of the people we work with don't have paddocks. Many of them don't um, have a boundary fence. So where it's appropriate and deemed to be cost effective for their business, they're looking at strategically placed paddocks that allow for some kind of rotation or time managed grazing. So you can spell country, graze country, elevated level of control than they had previously without the fence. So fencing is not new, putting in a fence is not new. Where it's placed, why it's placed and how you use it in your grazing management is the new thing. Water point management's another, that's a strong determinant as you know around where animals go, how long they spend there. This example on the right hand side is a pastoralist in WA um, in the east, uh, getting not that far from the SA border where a lot of his water points were open, small little dams, little catchments, um, the trough just, uh, sorry, the tanks just flowed into this little small dam. Uh, all sorts of animals, wild, unmanaged and managed animals went there as they chose. It didn't shape grazing patterns. So he's converted those to troughs, put them in little uh, yards with trap gates and he can control access to those water points um, much better now. Uh, Next slide is um, two different examples, managing livestock numbers, so the number of animals you run, the timeliness of sending them off property or to different parts of the property. So it's not just about the numbers of animals on your place, it's where are they, how long are they there for, and how are you managing them? And the image on the left is, is a real case where the, the cattle were sent from the pastoral property down to an agricultural, to a farm in the ag zone. Again, it's, it's a WA example. Uh, so it relieved grazing pressure on, on the dry station and there was feed available for backgrounding those animals on, on the farm. Rangeland self-herding is something I've spent five or more years working on with Bruce Maynard and some of you may have met Bruce. He's, he's been to South Australia a number of times in the last few years running workshops. In essence, the SNAP version of it is that we use animal behaviour and animal nutrition to shape grazing patterns. And we, we do that by using nutritional attractants paired with sight, sound and smell cues for the animals to know where the attractants are and to be motivated to go and seek them. And in, in this photograph, the visual cue is the traffic cone, the witch's hat. There's an audio cue of a homemade chime hanging in the tree that clangs in the wind. Um, there's a, an, a smell cue of, of um, is often used of molasses, diluted molasses, or, or as weird as it sounds, undiluted cordial sprayed around the trough, which has a distinctive smell that animals can learn. Okay, I smell that, I know what's coming if I go and seek it out. It's a pretty powerful um, tool actually and low cost and that's that's its real advantage over the infrastructure strategies that I showed you at the, at the beginning in the previous slide. Um, these three 
two slides to go, Louise, and I'll, and I, if I don't even have time to go through them, just jump in. I think the world will survive without them, but I, I just want to, if I can, show you an example of the self-herding in practice. This is a property in the Northern Territory near Catherine, where we did some work a couple of years ago. It's a nine square kilometre paddock on, showing on the left. You can see a big scalded patch in the middle. So it's quite a small paddock, it gets grazed every year. Every year it gets grazed in the same area. The scalded patch gets all the grazing. All the cues for the animals are to go there. The next mob of animals that go in next year will go there again. Um, all the pads lead to there. It's where some of the new grasses are coming up on the edge. It's very hard to repair. When we put GPS tracking collars on the animals and, and monitored them at the beginning, that's the middle picture. Brighter the colour tells us that's where the animals spent most of the time. So they spent most of the time on the scolded area, just as I said, and they went down to the pointy corner at the bottom in the southern end because that's where the single water trough was. So they moved between the water trough, the scold, the water trough, the scold. But over a series of weeks and months, we pulled through attraction, pulled the animals away from their, their learnt behaviours to bring in a new set of learnt behaviours that, that um, brought them into the areas on that southern southwestern fence line. So on the pretty much the left hand side, the western side of that image on the right, you now see a whole lot of new grazing areas with the green, the yellow and the red is we'd attracted them there over a series of weeks. And we, we reduced the impact on the scald. We didn't heal it in one year, it wasn't, wasn't magical. But in your context, as importantly as managing the scald is that the manager said the animals were grazing areas that had never been grazed before in the 10 years he'd been there, even in a small paddock. So there's a lot of a feed, feed resource uh, in our rangelands that aren't being used and other areas that are being overused. If we can start to get some sophistication around how we do it, but without spending a fortune, it lends itself well uh, to carbon as well because we have to show grazing management. And we've got tools now that can do that, whether it's infrastructure or behaviour based. This is the last slide. I slightly tell a lie. It's a picture before a graph and then I will stop, I promise. Um, uh, thank you for letting me show this one. It's not carbon. This is the one to just show you that in thinking about grazing management and getting your livestock into areas they weren't before and trying to get them to learn about moving so they, they build relationships amongst themselves in the mob rather than a location, bring in more country and under management, if you like. This data which came from France just kind of blew my mind really. Um, I was lucky enough to visit this shepherd uh, on a holiday in France a few years ago with the family and we were walking through this pine forest. Um, he was shepherding sheep as you can see and the animals weren't eating anything, they were just trundling along a path just like our, your cattle will, will track along a pad or a track or a fire break. You know, they're, they're on a mission, they're going somewhere. He stopped and, he, and, and he, he encouraged the animals to fan out. As soon as they did, their heads went down, their heads went up and they started eating. And he said, I want them to learn that the next time they come through here, there's something that's worth eating. Because if they just walked through there, they wouldn't have learnt it. So he was teaching them that there was food to be had and they learnt that when he stopped, it was worth them looking. Um, sometimes they stood under acorn trees and when the wind was blowing because they knew acorns were going to drop. Um, sometimes they were eating the grass. Nothing looked particularly edible to me, but the animals were, were busy. And this is the important thing that I'm finishing on, that it's a major drive to productivity. This is what a textbook says. If we look at feed quality across the bottom, measured by digestibility and how much does an animal eat? This is real data of people feeding a particular feed to animals for a month or so, they measure how much they eat and you plot it on a graph and that's what you get. The higher the quality of feed, the more the animals eat. Hopefully that you, that makes common sense to you. It's more they want to eat and it's more that they can eat. So the better quality feed, the more they eat. The textbook, you know, you can go to that and say, well, feed quality on my station at this point is, you know, there's 55% digestibility, animals will eat this much. 
But the data from France, from the shepherds, when they measured intake, these dots that are appearing on your screen now, and they're a bit pale, sorry, they're um, purple and blue. I hope the lighting where you are, you can see them. Um, and if my cursor is showing, uh, they're up in this elevated range. What they found is that the animals were eating double to triple what the textbook said. And the reason they do it, we know quite a lot about it now, is that they were eating a diverse range of feedstuffs, uh, not one single feed, which is what how, how the textbook gets that data. But in practice, animals often eat a limited range of feedstuffs because they go to a limited range of places. But if we can encourage grazing distribution, broaden their diet, they will be more productive, it will stimulate their intake. And to bring it back to the theme of the day, it enables you to consider a carbon project as well, because you have to be managing the timing and extent of grazing in a carbon project. So I'll stop. Um, these are a list of other methods. We can talk about them in question time, if you like, Louise. Um, over to you.